public speaking, don't be freaking. Just listen to the triple R technique in public speaking, don't be freaking. Just listen to the triple R technique. Public speaking, don't be freaking. Just listen to the triple R technique. Welcome everybody to Off the Cuff. I am Adam Banks. Thank you for listening to another show. This is episode 134, but it is episode four of the Communication Lecture Series. So thank you for joining us to hear another edition of the Communication Lecture Series where I'm able to pick a communication topic and lecture on it. Today, I'm going to be giving a lecture on the topic of how to assign a persuasive speech. And really what I'm going to do in this lecture is I'm going to tell you, um, I'm going to give an assignment and I am going to uh, teach students how to cite their sources. Now, this particular podcast is going to be a little different. I'm not going to be in studio doing the podcast. Right now I'm doing this introduction in the studio, but I am actually... Um, going to show you, or let you listen to rather, a lecture that I did live in person in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I was asked to fly down there by Ori Georgetown Technical College to give a lecture to a bunch of communication instructors on how to assign a persuasive speech. They said that they uh, were needing some guidance on that, which it was really cool. They flew me down to Myrtle Beach and they put me in a hotel on the beach, which was very nice. And they rented me a Dodge Charger, which was very fast. And they gave me a little bit of spending money to go out and have a fun time. But Myrtle Beach, it was a great time. It was only 48 hours I was there. But for two hours of lecture and uh, 48, 46 hours of entertainment. That was that was all right, and um, I, I wouldn't mind living in Myrtle Beach, to be honest with you. So, hey, if Ori Georgetown Technical College ever came knocking at my door to teach full time, I might would have to consider it. So, what I'm going to do is I'm now going to uh, take you live in the classroom of me giving a lecture to the instructors on how to how to teach a persuasive assignment. Enjoy. Okay. Uh, well, first off, let me just say thank you for having me. It's uh, been a pleasure to uh, be in the beach for a couple of days at least. I uh, uh, had this nice weather and uh, showing me all the gratitude. The hotel is nice and the plane trip was, it was great. No turbulence. Got here in an hour, but I really do thank you guys for that. Uh, so I hope to impress today. Okay, so uh, last class period, um, I introduced the concept of persuasive speeches to you guys, and today what I'm wanting to do is just kind of elaborate a little bit more on your persuasive speech assignment. So uh, persuasive speeches, that's my favorite type of speech to teach. It's my favorite type of speech to hear my students do because it challenges my way of thinking the day and age that we live in, everybody's got a different opinion about something. So it's always interesting to hear what students have to say about certain situations. And I love having my uh, thought process challenged because sometimes my students even persuade me to believe a different way. So I do like the persuasive speeches, so I'm excited to hear your guys' speech on uh, the topic. So before we uh, really dive into your persuasive speech assignment, I just got to say that there's three goals that you need to keep in mind to have a successful uh, persuasive speech. And if you accomplish these three goals, you will be successful while delivering your speech. The first goal that you need to have is you need to win over your listeners. That means that you hope that they adopt your view. You need to change their way of thinking because there's a good chance that the students, your audience, does not believe the same way you believe. So you are hoping to win over your listeners. You're hoping that they start believing the way you believe after your speech. The second goal is you need to know your subject. You need to know it through and through. That means you've got to research, you have to collect data. Because when you come in here and you're giving uh, your speech, there's going to be somewhat tension during a persuasive speech because you might be talking about something that somebody totally disagrees with you on. 
a big social issue is abortion. Everybody is either pro-life or pro-choice. It could cause a little tension in the room. So you want to be, if you want to stand at a certain side of the fence with abortion, you got to make sure you know every single thing about it because there's going to be people in your audience that may know a lot about it. It's going to challenge you at the end of your presentation. So you need to know your subject through and through. And the third goal that you need to have is you need to maintain a high standard of ethical behavior, meaning don't lie just to make yourself look good. Don't exaggerate. Only bring facts and things that can be proven. Don't just speak your opinion. So those three goals. Uh, when doing your persuasive speech, uh, you need to have some organization with it while you're delivering it. And um, usually when you're giving a persuasive speech, you're challenging somebody to take action about something. So I call this the motivated sequence, and there's five parts to this motivated sequence. The first is the attention. You need to capture your audience's attention. You can do that by asking a question at the beginning of your speech to provoke some thought. Uh, you could relate a story. For instance, I had a student in one of my uh, classes. She gave a persuasive speech on when you get to a certain age, she felt like that people should have to retest for their driver's license every year. So she started her persuasive speech out by relating a story to that, talking about an 80-year-old man who was driving down the road. He ran off the road because he fell asleep and he killed 11 children. Now, as shocking as that may sound, it caught everybody's attention and everybody was like, whoa. So everybody was already keen in on what she was saying. They were listening. So you can do something like that to grab your audience's attention. In other classes, we've talked about introductions and conclusions and how to, to do that. So uh, that's what you need to do during your speech. Uh, need. We live in a day and age that everybody is always want to know what's in it for me. How does this benefit me? Why is this even important to me? Why should I even listen to what you are even saying? So you need to present a need of why people need to believe the way you are uh, believing. For instance, if you wanted to uh, give a speech on a healthier living, living a healthier lifestyle, you need to present a need to why you need to live a healthier lifestyle. Well, what's a need? Um, you want to live longer, that's a need. Uh, by doing a healthier lifestyle, you could live longer, uh, you could lose some weight, um, uh, you could, uh, if, you, if you don't start living a healthier lifestyle, um, it could cause other health problems, diabetes, etc. Uh, satisfaction, uh, that means uh, you have to present a solution. Uh, present a solution after you uh, present your need. So the solution, let's keep it on um, living a healthier lifestyle. Uh, what's something that you could uh, do to uh, make that happen? Well, you could exercise, uh, you could um, eat healthier. Uh, the fourth thing would be visualization. That means you've got to paint a picture of the results. Um, after they believe, after you, they have adopted your view and you have told them what, told them what they have to do, Paint a picture of what will happen once they do it. Um, keeping it on the same example that I did about um, a healthier lifestyle, if they exercise and they start eating right, the visualization is they're going to look better, they're going to feel better, and it's just going to be a healthier way of living, and you could paint that picture for them. And the fifth thing is the action. That's where you're requesting them to do something. Let's say it's to stop smoking. Um, you know, you, uh, you could... You're challenging them to stop smoking. Or if you are doing a persuasive speech on volunteer work, um, you are telling them to go out and volunteer. Have like a sign-up sheet at the end of your presentation for a um, volunteer situation going on in the community. You know, have them take action after your speech because that is where the information is fresh in their mind. So uh, they're going to be able to go out there and take action with the information that you gave them. So let's talk about your persuasive speech assignment. And I put this on a PowerPoint that you, so you guys can uh, see this all together. I've also printed off some hard copies of your assignment, but I can also email those to you as well. Um, but just to kind of go over what you're going to be doing for this assignment, your basic requirement is you're going to speak to a topic that affects us as a public and is debated publicly. I went ahead and chose the topic for you, so you don't have to do that. And the topic is going to be, should the United States put more restrictions on gun ownership and use? The reason I like this topic is because... In America, we're living uh, all the time where there's a lot of gun violence, so it's a popular topic, and it'd be interesting to know where you guys stand on it. So what you have to do is just choose yes or no and present why you chose yes or why you chose no. Uh, this is a persuasive speech, so you do have to be persuasive. 
You are attempting to weaken your audience member support for the opposing case. Uh, so you need to develop arguments that are designed to sway audience members who may initially disagree with your position. The speech will be timed. It's going to be 10 to 15 minutes, and your grade will be lowered by five points for every 45 seconds you speak under or over the target time range. But that's a pretty good range to have. You have 10 to 15 minutes to talk about whatever you want to talk about or to talk about the subject that I gave you. Uh, just some notes here. The speech should not be memorized. Uh, it shouldn't be read completely off your paper. Um, because it's, you, you need to get, come up here and give a solid delivery. Um, putting your notes on a note card is just fine. Uh, just bullet points. Um, sources, you have to have sources for a persuasive speech because you're going to have to do some research. Uh, you're going to have to orally cite your sources. I would like a minimum of three sources. Two of these sources uh, must be available in print. Um, in other words, you can only use one site, one web source. Your evidence should clearly support your arguments and you should explain um, the uh, arguments that you have. You should include a variety of evidence, statistics, examples, testimonies. You have to use one visual aid for this. A PowerPoint would suffice if you would like. You could use somebody in your audience um, as a visual aid uh, to volunteer for you. You could bring in a prop, whatever you would like to use. So why do we even need to research? Why is research even... Why is research even important? <clears throat> well, one, when you research, it establishes your credibility. You may ask, what is credibility? Credibility is simply the characteristic of being trustworthy. When you do research, you're not just standing up here and just shooting off your opinion on why you think this way. You're actually bringing in facts. You're bringing in statistics. You're bringing in examples, stuff that has been published. So your audience is going to trust you more. Uh, your research makes your points go from opinion to fact. You're bringing in evidence. For instance, if I'm giving a persuasive speech on why everybody should have um, a cat, um, it would sound a lot better if I said uh, this information from a veterinarian says that everyone needs an animal rather than saying everyone needs an animal because my 10-year-old sister is always happy when she has one. <clears throat> Your uh, the value of research also keeps your information current and it keeps your information relevant. Everybody, if you're given a persuasive speech on cigarettes back in 1985, your research is going to be a lot different than what it would be in 2016 because there's been new research, there's been new developments in the topic. So it keeps your information current and relevant. Everybody, when they get sick, they want to go to the best hospital. Why? Because it... Uh, they have all the updated technology. They have, they have all the updated information. They have all the updated research. Same with the school. Everybody wants to go to the school with the latest research and the latest technology. You're going to have to cite your sources when you do your research. Why? Why do you need to cite your sources? Well, there's this little thing called plagiarism that can get you kicked out of school for. And plagiarism is using someone's words without giving them credit. Now, this is easily done. Um, sometimes people do it without even knowing they're plagiarizing. Um, like I was uh, doing some research on um, uh, space and astronauts one time, and um, I found out that astronauts actually grow while they're in space. So I could say that, and um, I could just think that's common knowledge that everybody knew that astronauts grew in space, but it's not. And if I didn't say where I got that, that's plagiarism. So you need to watch out for that. Um, it shows your audience your information is trustworthy. Again, it's not just uh, what you're saying. It's not your opinion. It's a fact that's proven. Uh, and it also signifies that you became prepared to deliver your speech. It shows your audience that you took the time out to prepare your speech. It shows your audience that you took the time out to, to research and find and collect that data. So how do you cite your sources? Um, well, a citation is a verbal reference to your source of information. It should be a reliable source. Uh, Students like to use Wikipedia. That's not a reliable source. A reliable source would be a journal or be a book or uh, something published, something from a credible website. Um, it should come before or after your fact. After you say your information, you should say before or after uh, where you got your information from. A direct quote is using someone else's exact words but giving them credit. So I could say this, and this would be a correct way to cite a source. I could say, in the words of Albert Einstein, a person who never made a mistake never tried anything new. You could paraphrase, and that is simply just restating someone else's words in your own words, which I like to do a lot. But you still have to say who you're paraphrasing. 
Uh, try to vary your source introductions because if you don't, you'll catch yourself a lot saying according to, according to, according to, according to, and that will become repetitive and people will get sick of that, tired of that. So try to just vary it up a little bit. Say, in this book, author Tim Jones states, yada, yada, yada. You could say, the New York Times published an article that found blah, 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 blah. So try to vary it up a little bit. <clears throat> so let me read you these two um, statements so you can see what I mean. And, I, and so you can see the point of why you need to cite your sources and, and uh, why researching sounds a lot better. Uh, number one, teenagers spend too much time with their electronic gadgets. This obsession takes them away from the real world and leaves them unprepared for adult life. <laughs> this sounds like something my uh, grandma would say. You know, this is, you know, it just sounds like an angry grandparent just talking about kids always on um, phones. It's really no uh, credibility to that. But if you say it like this, according to a recent study from the Kayser Family Foundation, teenagers spend over seven and a half hours a day using le electronic devices, mainly smartphones, computers, and TVs. This, preoccup this preoccupation leaves a little time to give undivided attention to homework, family time, and extracurricular activities, all of which are essential steps towards adult life. So already your audience is going to find you more trustworthy when you say sentence two rather than sentence one. So now this is uh, just the different things that you can cite from, and uh, I would like for you to do this orally in your presentation. <clears throat> for citing a book, you're gonna uh, cite the author's first and last name, uh, then the title and the year of publication. Let me give you an example. According to the book Assessment for Learning, published in 2010, Violet Miranda noted professors at the University of Ohio of Hawaii state that uh, citing a journal or a magazine article, you'll do the author's first and last name, the title, the date issue was published. And then you, this is the example. In December 2012, edition of Prevention, author and food director Lori Powell wrote an article titled Power Soups that describes healthy soup recipes to increase your energy. Citing a website, uh, you put the name of the website, sponsoring institute, date it was last edited, section of the website. Here's an example. In the Learn About Cancer, Cancer section of the website for the American Cancer Society, last updated in 2013, the section on ovarian cancer says that in the T1 stage of cancer, the tumor is limited to one or more, or one or both ovaries. In citing interviews, you put the date, the name of the interviewer, and the name of the interviewee. And I found this very interesting when I was researching this. Pierce Morgan, CNN correspondent, conducted an interview with former President Bill Clinton on September 25th, 2012, and found that Clinton <coughs> was eligible to be president of Ireland and France if he wanted to. So with me saying that, uh, you know, without saying Pierce Morgan, the CNN correspondents, and all of that nice information before that, it just sounds you don't know whether or not you could believe me or not. You could just say, well, are you sure that that's the truth? Well, according to this reliable CNN correspondent source, because CNN is, is a, would be considered a reliable source, this would make you more trustworthy, more credible, and it also avoids the plagiarism. I had some examples, uh, and uh, the examples was uh, just a video of a persuasive speech, but I, I think I'm, I'm fine with just uh, ending it there. Is there any questions on your assignment? Any questions, students? <laughs> the speech has to be 10 to 15 minutes long. All right, and that pretty much sums up the topic of how to teach a persuasive assignment. And that concludes this episode of Off the Cuff and this edition of the Communication Lecture Series. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for listening to the show. I'm Adam Banks. We will see you in the next episode. Have you ever seen a hip hop show where the MC's completely locked into the flow? His words are clear, his voice is loud, and she really knows how to interact.